Welcome back to Urology 101. I'm James Farrell, and recently we talked about the upper urinary tract anatomy that comprised the adrenal glands, the kidneys, the ureters, down to the bladder. Today we're going to talk about the lower urinary tract anatomy. And we're going to try and do it in about three or four minutes. Just get you the basics, understand some concepts. You can refer back to it another day, especially for some of the um, pathology things that we talk about in some of the other videos. But I think it's, again, it's a good thing for a roadmap so you understand where some of these organs are and how they might affect some of the symptoms and sensations that you have that you bring to talk to your physician about. This is going to be a male model primarily because we do see mostly male patients in urology. We see female patients and I'll ad lib with the model where I can to support those concepts. So let's get into it here. What we're looking at here so this is sort of looking at a patient from the side. So if you cut me right down the middle, then and looked at the side, this is the view that you're seeing this model. And let's name some terms, obviously. Penis, testicle, tube back here is the epididymis. This is the vas deferens that travels all the way around the bladder back into the back of the urethra. We'll talk about that. That's a prostate, bladder, ejaculatory duct, and seminal vesicles. Rectum, all right? So if we talk about the penis first, you have two different groups of bodies in here. And the penis tends to have three bodies overall that get rigid when a guy gets erect. And the two on top, there are two long cylinders, kind of like this. And those are called the corporal bodies or corporal cavernosa. And they have an outer kind of fibrotic edge that holds all of the blood in there when blood rushes in, but those are what get erect. And then underneath that, on the underside of the penis, or the ventral side of the penis, that's called the corpus spongiosum, and inside of that is the urethra. And then obviously the opening of the urethra is at the head of the penis. So let's go back to this. Okay, so corpus cavernosum, corpus spongiosum. And there are different parts of the urethra, and we can get into that if we're gonna talk about some of the things that happen to urethras. But for this purposes, it's just one long urethra. And back here is one part called the prostate, and inside of that is the prostatic urethra. And then on the back of the prostate, what enters into the urethra are the ejaculatory ducts and the seminal vesicles. Now the seminal vesicles have and create most of the fluid that is actually semen and the ejaculate that then helps sperm get to fertilizing egg. The ejaculatory ducts are the end openings where the vas deferens allows sperm to be transported into the urethra, shot out with the seminal fluid that the prostate and the seminal vesicles make. And after you're done having kids, the prostate and the seminal vesicles, specifically the prostate, really only causes you problems. It has no function after you have kids. But it does act like a cork in a wine bottle to help hold urine in or make it really hard to get urine out, depending on your perspective. So the bladder sits here, and then the bladder opens up a little bit when you urinate, and then urine goes through the prostatic urethra and comes out the end of the penis. This right here is the ureteral orifice from where the ureter plugs into the bladder. You have one on each side. And then on the back here, this is the vas deferens, and it starts down here by the testicle. So inside the testicle, these, these excuse me, there are these things called seminiferous tubules, millions and millions of tubes that are all designed to create mature sperm and bring them to this worm-like structure on the back of each testicle called the epididymis. Famously, it gets tender and epididymitis, it swells, it feels like a worm structure on the back of the testicle and can be kind of painful when you squeeze it. But it's normal, so don't think that it's abnormal. And on the bottom, it connects to the vas deferens. That's where sperm sits, and when you ejaculate, or when you have an orgasm, sperm shoot around here, all the way through the vas deferens, out the urethra. <clears throat> and in the back here, the rectum sits, where the prostate is uh, near to it. So that'll be important when we talk about doing biopsies on prostates, but also just to understand that things in the pelvis get pretty close. The, the pubic bone is right here, and you can see that the prostate sits pretty low in the pelvis, and that's something that we'll talk about as well. For the women, obviously get rid of that. The urethra comes out right under the pubic bone, and then right where my finger is, this would be the vagina. And the vagina is a potential space, meaning that it usually doesn't have anything in it. And then the bladder is in front, and the rectum is behind. So the women have a lot of stuff that coalesces and comes together in the pelvis. So sometimes when we talk with women about voiding dysfunction, we'll talk about constipation because if you have a lot of stool sitting there in the rectum, that's going to push on the bladder by transmitting through the vagina. And then sometimes when women will come in and talk about incontinence, 
we need to identify if it's stress incontinence, meaning that the urethra moves up and down a little bit and simply urine leaks out. And also, if the bladder sort of drops down into the vagina a little bit, and that's called pelvic organ prolapse. And that can also happen with the rectum. And that's really the anatomy I want to get through in what is about four minutes, I lied, not three. But I hope that that's helpful. It's a roadmap, and it's going to be useful as we go forward with some of these talks. So have a good day. Take care of your families. Take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.